see you back there. Are you guys not reading the comments? Oh yeah, I have. I, have. I do. I just didn't see that one. Okay, there was some. There, there was a couple about you today. I said some funny ones about you guys. Every week, one of us becomes the person who everybody, for who most people talk about. This week, it's Greg, but last week it was Mark. And then Chase has this normal stream of Chase's tan and Chase's books and Chase's this and Chase's that. And I like we're not I like anymore. It. The best comment I ever got was Chase Tan Daddy. <laughs> That's code for something. <laughs> you should have said that, dude. You really should. It'll show up again somewhere, I'm sure. Tan Daddy. All right. That's going to show up. Yeah. You're damn right it will. <laughs> I can see a GIF. I can see a little GIF somewhere out there saying Tan Daddy. Tan Daddy. Tan yeah. Yeah. Tan yeah. Oh, that was a good one. Okay. Everybody ready? Yeah. Ready. Ready. All right. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they speak, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military. I'm a behavior expert, behavior profiling expert. I teach persuasion, influence, and interrogation to government agencies and the general public. And I'm also the proud owner of this new book right here called Understanding Body Language by Scott Rouse. Greg? Thank you, Chase. Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. I've also put together this course with Scott Rouse, Body Language Tactics at bodylanguagetactics.com. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, two things that we we get more requests for. We get, there's a bunch of stuff we get requests for, so we're trying to knock some of those out. And here we're going to kill two birds with one stone. We're, talking to, we're going to talk about Michael Jackson and his body language and the two guys that accused him. Uh, when they, from when they were younger, being abused by Michael Jackson. Now, keep in mind as we go through this, these these aren't together. In other words, we're not going to listen to, you know, Michael Jackson refuting what they're saying because there are, there's no footage of that. But we are going to hear the, the hear the the uh, two accuse the guys who who are accusing him of doing this. Safe Chuck and what's the other guy's name? Anybody remember? Dobson. Something like that. Yeah. Like that. So the real, we're going to listen to both of those talk about what happened to them during that. And we're going to tell you what we see in their body language. And as we do this, keep in mind, that's all we're doing. We're just telling you what we see in this in these specific videos. If I see something, I'm going to say, here's what I see. If Mark sees something, here's what I see. If Chase sees something, here's what I see. If Greg sees, sees something, here's what I see. We're not on anybody's side. We're not on Michael Jackson's side. And we're not on the accuser's side. We're just telling you what we see when we do this. That's it. It could be different. What I'm seeing could be different than, than what Greg's seeing. We could all be seeing something different, but we're telling you what we see. That's yeah, all we're doing. And so having said that, Scott, I think what you're going to find today is you're going to get some discussion. And that's good. We want to discuss what we're seeing on both in both cases. What we're not trying to do is say, okay, this take it to the bank. Michael Jackson did it because of the way he looks in video one and two, or that these guys – or saying something in videos three and four and five and six. What we're looking for is what does Michael look like when he's talking to Martin Bashir in this case? And if we see deception, we'll say, hey, this is a good indicator of deception. And here's your baseline. Now, if you find a video that shows him directly contradicting something, we would love to see that video. We just didn't find a great one. So if you'll put it in the comments, we'll, we read the comments and we'll find it. And we'll come back and review it again. We'd love to. Yeah. yeah, or send it to uh, the behavior panel at gmail.com. And while you're here and while you're thinking about it, go ahead and subscribe to our channel and hit that little bell that'll let you know when we have something new come out. And hit the like button too. We're trying to get as many likes as we can get on this one. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. Yes, here we go. One of the things that you've clearly used to overcome this is changing your appearance. You, you've, you've kind of you know, you're, you're, you've physically changed, haven't you? The photographs of you, if I look at them No, it's from... called adolescence. It's called growing and changing. Y yeah, but even the shape of your face has changed. No, it has not. I've had no plastic surgery on my face, just my nose. It helped me breathe better so I can hit higher notes. All right, Chase, what do you got? 
We see some immediate pre-swallow behavior here as soon as the subject of the question comes out, which is a stress indicator. I think it's odd that when almost anyone would use a left to right timeline when talking about growing up, he goes right to left. I've never seen this in 20 years. Maybe you guys have, but I think that might be a glimpse into how he's viewing aging or his desire to age on a timeline, kind of going backwards. And his hand's kind of waving away the accusation. You can see it down towards the bottom of your screen, but he is a professional dancer from a very young age. So I think that might be well within his baseline. It's in many of his other videos. His blink rate is 13 throughout the video until the man mentions shape of your face and the blink rate goes from 13 to 74 during, during this denial. And somebody with this much cosmetic stuff uh, kind of going on with their face, their blink rate and word choice might just be all you really have to go on. I'll pass it to you, Greg. Yeah, so for me, I look at him, he starts off with a downright and a deep swallow, and his chin is down just a touch. There's some baggage already between him and Martin Bashir, I think, by this point of the interview. This is he's going at him. If you go watch the special, this is late when he's going after some issues, and you can see those that hard eye contact. And I'm with you, Chase. His, his skin around his face is like a cloth. It's just loose. I mean, it's there. Everything's tucked. Everything's tight. There's no, I think he's in his 40s here, give or take. And there is no, like, there are no lines or any of that kind of thing. Um, there's a, a ton of other stuff going on with him here. This is, okay, we know he's not telling the truth based on autopsy. They found um, cuts behind his ears or scars behind his ears on both sides of his nose. So he had something else done. So if he's saying, no, I just, I haven't had anything done. It's just aging. Then we know it's not true. So we're starting to get a baseline for what he looks like when he's being deceptive. I would also say this guy is a master of illusion, for, for lack of a better term. He's great at redirects with his hands and with his body. That whole moonwalk thing that it looks like he's floating is him. That's what he's masterful at movement. So the hand is not an accident with him, I think, Chase. I think you're dead on. It's just something he does. And he is masterful at the way he communicates and creating an image. And that's all you're seeing here is the image that he's created. And when he says out loud, well, it's just puberty. Well, I've been watching you since before puberty, after puberty, and way, way after puberty, and I've seen changes. That's what I would have said to him and put him back on the hot seat. But you don't see that in Martin Bashir. And it's not like, not like Martin Bashir is afraid to be aggressive and nasty. So I'm surprised he didn't go there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so Bashir loads the question, really. He frames it with the idea of um, control of the body as a coping mechanism. He says, you've had to control your body as a way of coping. And my guess is, is, is it's loaded on purpose in order to trigger Jackson into something a little more aggressive, which I think it 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 does. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. We're we're dealing here with one of the biggest stars in the world, somebody who uh, and one of the greatest controllers of movement in the world, one of the most brilliant dancers ever. So we've got to expect this is somebody who can control the the body mass there certainly. Um, uh, so we get this uh, emphatic wipe gesture, which is what I would call a moderator gesture. It's there to say, hey, we're done with that. We're wiping that clean. We're never going there. Again, it's big. It's an, it's an emphatic one. Um, no plastic surgery. Very emphatic. No plastic surgery. Just my nose. So there's a qualifier there. But it's great how that works, isn't it? You start with an absolutely emphatic denial. And then you put a little qualifier on the end that absolutely changes the emphatic nature of the denial. What I want to pick up on here, which I think is really interesting, is you see his, his fingers and he's got three um, bandages on them. This was something he did as well as having white socks or wearing gloves or shooting his cuffs uh, so that you'd be able to see his movement on stage. It's something he picked up from, from Gene Kelly, uh, you know, other great dancers of Hollywood, ways of being able to see the body move on stage. And apparently he put these white bandages on his fingers as well, so you'd be able to see those move. But why is he wearing them in an interview? So 
there's no, we don't need to see his fingers move. He's not on a big stage anymore. What's interesting in my mind is these become symbolic of damage already. It's like a child going, look at, look at the boo-boos that I have. Look at the, look, look, I'm injured here. So I'm, I'm just picking up on that imagery there that doesn't need, or, or these are devices, these are stage devices, but now I think they've become an image of hurt and pain. Uh, is that something he wears all the time to display? Is that something to get our sympathy with him? Not sure at this point, just interests me. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, I think he's ready for this question. Obviously, he would be because he knew they were going to talk about this. So he's talked with his lawyers. He's talked with whoever he can consults with to say, how do I approach this? What's the, Because he's one of those guys. He wants to make sure he controls everything that comes out about him from the way he sounds, the way he looks, and just everything you were saying, Mark, everything. So what we're seeing here when he starts asking the questions, you're right, Chase, his blink rate goes to almost nothing. And he gets really still and he just stares at him as he's talking because he's taking this in and he doesn't know the exact question. He knows the question's coming, but how's it going to be shaped? How's it going to be formed? So he's learning that as it comes in. And then um, his, when he starts asking, his mouth opens a little bit, up, like he's ready, like he's going to jump the gun, but he doesn't. He holds back, I think. That's what that looks like. I can't really tell if that was just something he, that happened from as just as a reaction, a limic reaction, or it was just getting ready to start talking. Then we see his head go back when he starts to, before he answers, his head starts going back in that dominance gesture, saying, I, here's, here, I'm getting ready to give you the answer. Here's what's really happening. So his head goes back and he exposes that throat. Then he talks about, um, when, when, um, you're, I'm growing, you know, that the changes you're seeing came from growing and changing. And he starts using his illustrators for those types of things. And those really, they're not hitting hard on the words where they should. I know I always talk about that, but they're not hitting where they should be hitting. And actually, in a few minutes, we see him give an extra one when he, when he gives that and then does one extra. Uh, that denotes, it indicates that he's not sure about that because he knows it's not true. He knows that those things have changed since he was a child. If you look at when he was a child, you look at when he turned into the Michael Jackson everybody knew, you couldn't say, that's him. You, you couldn't put those two together. You couldn't say, if that was his kid, you wouldn't say, wow, he looks like his dad. He looks nothing like his, he would look nothing like him. He looks nothing like he used to look. Um, and then, yeah, when he wipes away that, that thing about uh, when he asks him, um, your face has changed and he wipes away that, that question. You'll see that a lot with, with people who are telling stories about seeing a ghost that you knew wasn't true or probably isn't true. Because they'll, they'll say, oh, here's what happened. I did this and this and this and that happened. And they'll wipe away what they just said. And in this case, he's wiping away that, that question. Almost to get rid of it. We're getting rid of that. We're not going to do, you know, here's the answer. Forget that. I'm going to give you the answer. Um, and when he points to his nose, he says he's making a big production about this, and like Mark was saying, it's almost like a chaffing one of one of Greg's things, chaff and redirect. Uh, what do you call it? A Hartleyism, where it's chaff and redirect. He says he does the big thing, was, and I can talk about nose is one of my things. Is why it's so big. I, sh I should get some of that done, maybe. But he points at his nose, like in a big way, make a big deal about it, then moves to to the other stuff. So this, I would say, is it, it, for me. I'm seeing tons of deception here. Tons of deception. And he gets, if you'll notice, if you'll listen to the volume of things, it's quieter as he goes along. Fading facts is what I was um, ahead to. And then uh, sometimes we do see his eyebrows go up as he's nodding and another Hartleyism requesting approval. So that's one of the, that, that's what I'm seeing in there. So. Yep. One of the things that you've clearly used to overcome this is changing your appearance. You, you've, you've kind of, you know, you're, you're, you've physically changed, haven't you? The photographs of you, if I look at them No, it's from... called adolescence. It's called growing and changing. Y yeah, but even the shape of your face has changed. No, it has not. I've had no plastic surgery on my face, just my nose. It helped me breathe better so I can hit higher notes. All right, be good? Yeah, good. Beautiful. All right. But are you, are you, Michael, are you honestly saying that you've only ever had one operation? Two. You've had two? As I can remember. Yeah, just two. But Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think I see distraction here. This, this two that comes in, and it's very big in the screen. Listen, he knows how to perform. He knows what's going to fill up a screen. He knows how to sound in a way that's going to uh, redirect you, disturb you. 
so, so, so he makes a big, big impression with that too. And does it sound quite childlike to you? It's quite innocent, isn't it? It's like a three-year-old, you know, yeah, how many fingers am I holding up? Two. You know, it's just beautifully childlike and demonstrative. So that's of interest to me. And then he qualifies it, as I can remember. So, you know, that again, completely negates how emphatic he was at the start. Uh, there's another emphatic uh, hand wipe gesture to go, look, we're done with that. That's over. Let's move on. Um, yeah, that's all I got on that one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I love the fact we're both on the two-year-old. I always say every person, all of us included, are nothing but two-year-olds covered in scar and, and hairs. That's all we are. We just keep layering and layering and layering. Interestingly, <clears throat> the earlier you get isolation or above the law, and I don't mean literally above the law in this case, but the earlier you get to a point where you don't get the same inputs as other people, the quicker you freeze. And by that, I mean arrested development of sorts so that a person who becomes very famous at eight years old, imagine what their inputs become. Adulation, you can do no wrong. And they freeze to some degree in those kinds of behaviors. Now, I'm not talking about him specifically because I was never exposed to Michael Jackson. But that too, if you ask a child a question and they're trying to lie to you, they're emphatic because that's what they do. They're emphatic. And then he redirects. He's doing all that stuff he does. I can hear woohoo, you know, doing something as he moves his hands around when I watch this. I just see Michael the product and I see him working you. And then the other piece I see is him look back to his right and recall. Somebody's coached him that he needs to say, as I recall, I just about guarantee you. So he's not putting himself in a bind. And we all know that if I can't remember, I can't be held accountable, right? That's the whole thing. That's the way we go. But I see a child here and you'll see it pop up again in the next segment. You'll see childlike behavior. And I think it's what he's gotten away with his entire life. And he probably is not exactly what my army career personality would think of as an adult because he's never been forced to be that adult. So I think that's where he's at. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So we see uh, this hand gesture of two. He's using the back of his hand. And I spent some time today looking at videos. This is a strong deviation from his normal behavior. He's a very open palm communicator. And this is followed by a short eye flutter. And eye flutter is, is something we do that some body language people will call eye blocking. But we also, another reason that humans do this is when our CPU is processing a bunch of information, our eyes will blink a lot. And they're asking him a baseline question here, which is pretty basic. And his eyes go to nine, nine o'clock. As we're seeing the video, his eyes move to nine o'clock, which would make me, if I'm the interviewer, that immediate eye movement, I'm going to, I'm going to remember that. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to check this in a few seconds to see if it goes back to this spot again when I'm asking him about the car he drives, where he lives, the street address, what his house looks like, that kind of thing. And that's important. And there's a use of it, what's called an exclusion statement here. As far as I know, as far as I recall, if memory serves, those kinds of things. There's two different ways we can judge this on deception. For one, if I'm asking Scott, hey, Scott, does the guy that lives six doors down from you make crystal meth in his garage? And Scott goes, well, uh, not to the best of my knowledge. That's not deceptive. But if I ask Scott, if Scott, are you making crystal meth in your garage? And you go, uh, no, not as far as memory serves. So the, the way you ask a question determines whether or not those exclusion statements are deceptive or not. And we see the hand wave, the wiping again. And there's some very prominent lip licking behavior right after his answer with some and this is just a hygienic gesture. And a hygienic gesture is anything designed to improve your appearance. And this is more likely to be deceptive. And his blink rate again goes from 26 to the high 80s. It was too hard to calculate the exact number. Scott, what do you got? Wow. All right. Well, when one thing, if you'll listen to him, if you'll listen to this, you hear this little tapping noise. It's him tapping his feet and his hands on his legs. Because when he, when he first comes in and he says... Um, 
um, when he gives that gesture of two, then you hear him put his hand down his lap and you hear it slapped out like, that's it. That's all you're getting. That's the answer. And that's as far as I'm going. Like it's, so it's like two, that's it. So that's, that's what I'm seeing there. So he's trying, so he knows that's not right. So, but he's trying to put a stop to it before he goes any further. Um, and so those are the adapters you're hearing his feet tapping in his hands, which denotes he's being nervous. He's getting wound up here. He's getting, getting wired a little bit. Um, and when you say, when you ask him if, he, if he's had, when he says how many, you know, if you had more than one, he says, I've only had two. You've only had two as far as I can remember. I remember every surgery I've had. I've had three. And I remember, and I have a story about every, every one of them. I can tell you something that happened before and something that happened after. If I came to you guys and I said, and, and I was going to have two nose jobs, if I got one done, and I said, I said, well, I'm going to go have another nose job. You go, you having another one? I'd be like, yeah, because, you know, I want to get, it needs to be even smaller than that. You guys would talk behind my back. It would be a really big deal. I wouldn't be thinking, and you would say, you don't need, it would be a big deal. I would remember that. Well, maybe he's talking about two points of entry, nose and behind the ears. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> could be. Who knows? But... All right. That's what I got. You guys ready? By the way, Scott, if you said you were going to get two nose jobs, I would pay for the second one. <laughs> <laughs> But are you, are you, Michael, are you honestly saying that you've only ever had one operation? Two. You've had two? As I can remember. Yeah, just two. But All right, here we go. If I, if I look at some of the photographs of you in your adolescence... Yeah, I changed. People changed. But, but even after, when you did the Thriller album, hmm? your, your lips are very different now to no, what they were no, then. No. But they, they do look different. No, sorry. You Same don't think lips. so? Nope. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so in my many, many, many interrogations, I never heard anybody go, nope, the way he did like a child at the end of that. That reminded me of like a, a six-year-old saying, I'm not doing it. Nope, 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 nope. Again, somebody who got away with a whole lot from six years old till now is talking to me is what I would think in the interrogation room. And I would jack him up pretty good. I mean, it wouldn't be physical, but I would certainly go after him and start going back to that child and making him feel inferior for something. You know, I would go after him. But that's the weirdest thing for a 40-something-year-old man to say, nope, nope. And what he's in effect doing is the same thing a four-year-old or a six-year-old does. He's drawing a fence and saying, you're not getting anything else. I'm done with it. That's that. In terms of, are those his real lips? Or are they the original lips he had before? Well, we all know better, but he's licking his lips He's, his blink rate is up. This is probably the highest we're going to see his blink rate. And it's more of a flutter as he's trying to deal with what he's seeing. And it's that arrested development behavior again. All of this is a little kid going, nope, nope, not going to do it. Nope, nope. And that's all I hear when I'm listening to him. I would, again, I don't, we all know better. We know that it was puberty. Puberty changed me. Okay, well, let's take a picture of you now, 10 years ago, 10 years before that and 10 years. Have you been in puberty since... Like the wall, was that when puberty hit you? And then you've been through a long drawn out puberty through the wall and thriller and every one of those things is what he should do. You take apart his story with facts and we've got a great baseline for lying Michael here. This is good. We know he's lying. So we're seeing what he normally does. Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, I think we're seeing the tension build here because you hear that tapping is going through the roof at this point. And, and we'll be able to talk about this, uh, Chase, is when, when he's lip, licking his lips here, that might be a, a pre-violence thing. When you see somebody, they'll get back, they'll, they'll start that sometimes, not, not every time. So that, that could be that. That's one thing I can see there. I don't see that as, as a grooming gesture at that point because he hadn't said lips yet because he, he does it before he says lips, almost like he uh, is bringing attention to him. And then, I, and I think he's reaching his, his point of, I've had enough with Bashir. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so to that pre-violence piece, I think um, I think we see, ironically, some thinning of the lips. And and I think he's, he's truly getting angry. And I think that's, the, you know, the lip licking that we're getting there is something about fight and flight starting to happen, uh, moisture changing in the mouth, those lips thinning. He's getting quite upset, aggressive. Uh, I think, you know, to the point of Bashir, I think he's, playing quite innocent in this, in his line of questioning. You know, he's just going, you know, my point of view, I don't quite get this, this is kind of odd. Playing the innocent in this, which may be even compounding how innocent um, uh, uh, Jackson is getting. Uh, one last thing on this is just the emphatic shaking of the head 
here. Um, again, it, it's, it's, you know, we always talk about uh, strong positive denial. And, and so you might go, hey, look at that, you know, nonverbal, strong positive denial. No, it's just it's too much. It's too much when somebody's shaking their head. You know, one, two, that's enough. One, two, three, maybe. Not one, it doesn't have to be that big. And then, nope, at the end of it, really buttons that one down. You know, um, even though this is the king of pop, this is a complete individual, this is somebody who is is irreplaceable on the planet, there are still behaviours that you expect to see which are a little more universal. And so you don't expect an emphatic denial at that big kind of level, even from somebody like him. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. This uh, very regressive uh, head shaking no is many times the same way you see a kid do that in the middle of your question. Once they know the topic of the question, they begin the denial. And uh, don't see that very often in adults. If I if I look at some of the photographs of you in your adolescence, yeah, I changed. People change. But but even after when you did the Thriller album, hmm? your your lips are very different now to no, what they were no, then. No. But they they do look different. No, sorry, you Same don't think lips. so? Nope. He's close. Right, we good. Yeah. Good for you. Were you aware that Jordan Chandler or his family on his behalf filed a litigation, a lawsuit against you? Yes. Were you aware at, that at some point in time in that lawsuit, Adrienne McManus gave her deposition? I'm not positive. Your answer confuses me. Uh, how do you mean you're not positive? You don't know whether she gave her deposition or not? Exactly. Either. All right, Chase, what do you got? So for this one, we're starting to see that eye flutter behavior is a, a great indicator of stress for Michael. And even when he's answering honestly and he's under stress, we'll see these, this eye flutter. And this actually scores a 23 on the behavioral table of elements. It's like uh, looks like the periodic table, but it's all human behavior on here. And it's made to score stress and relaxation or just deception. And we'll break it down just really quick. He has lip retraction, which is a four, and the lip retraction happens before his answer. And then he has a deviation recall of eye movement. So instead of looking at his eye home where he normally would look to recall most of the stuff he remembers, he looks a different direction. That would be another four. Then he has lip licking, which is he's wetting the lips, a hygienic gesture, which is a four, and lip compression afterwards. So if, if you compress your lips before you answer a question, that's typical of someone thinking really hard about the answer. So it's less deceptive. So if I asked you, what'd you do on Wednesday night? And you said, well, I uh, went out to dinner. So that's more likely to be truthful. So but lip compression after your statement or after your answer is still a four. And then there's some immediate emotional recall eye movement or just an internal dialogue or internal conversation after his statement, which is a three and a second lip retraction, which means the lips pass the barrier of the teeth, which is a four, giving him a score of 23. And finally, I'll just say the cardinal sin here, the attorney asks a question and then offers an answer and only allows Michael just to say yes or no, which is a one thing when I'm teaching attorneys, you never do that. You always want them to answer as much as possible. You don't want to offer them the answer to the question and then just let them confirm or deny. Greg? Yeah, so the interrogator instructor in me is going to give you what that's called an interrogation. That's called a leading question. Yes, no, any of those that allow you an out, an easy out, did you, will you, have you, are you, all those are bad questions questions elicit a narrative response. So you ask a question that's open-ended and they roll off their tongue and people can't shut up. Once they start talking, they, they leak information with stressors and with illustrators that punctuate what you're thinking. And all of us would sit over and go, aha, that matters, this doesn't, and we'd run right through it. Interestingly, when you ask him the question, you talk about a postural bump, he does what I call target shrinking. Whoop. He goes down into like a little divot and I think all he does is lean back 
But it's interesting, I think in part because he moves for a living. He moves more than I would if I were in that same chair because movement's who he is and it's how he's wired. The other interesting piece is when they start to ask him questions and they ask him, "Did uh, is he aware? There's suddenly a, a rise in adrenaline in him. You can't miss it. You can see the fight or flight and the moving his mouth. And then as he's trying to internalize what they're thinking, if you have kids, you know they do this. You have to teach them not to do it so they don't look stupid when they get to school. And that's when they're writing or coloring. They're doing all this. All mammals, all mammals, when they're thinking, move their mouth. It's a learned behavior to do away with it. I train horses. When they get a topic, they start moving their mouth. It's just because we are milk drinkers, I suppose. There's something in our wiring that causes us to move our mouth when we're thinking. So you go from there. You watch him. He starts to think. And then when he's asked a question about whether he knew, you see him go up and to his right. And that's the same thing we saw from him when he was coached before. Probably an indicator. He's coaching, internalizing, answering the question in a way he's been taught. All that, he's easy to read. You can watch him across the way. You can be a musical genius and not necessarily a genius in other arenas. And he's in not his arena at the moment. So here we go. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so a breathing rate is right up, double what it should be, I think, at, at resting. The way I read breathing rate is just to look for that kind of area of a collar, usually a button, something like that, and you'll just see it move. Even in low-quality video like this, look at that area, and you can see it going up and down. You can read the breathing rate really, really easily. You can, And, and all you need to do is just breathe along to it and see how you feel because how you're feeling is going to be indicative of how he's feeling. There are some things which are very, very similar in every human being. Your levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to have an effect on your endocrine system. That's going to shoot off some neurotransmitters in your brain, and you'll get a feeling immediately around this. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, he, Greg. He, he goes back in his chair, and, and it's quite significant. Even for somebody who we think would be moving a lot, we see him go very still, and then he moves back. So so instantly I go, okay, that's notable, that's significant. I think what happens here uh, to, to all, this, all these points here of, being, of those being yes or no answers is he realises it's a yes or no answer. And so there isn't a way for him to really obfuscate, get around this in any way. And, you know, he has to, has to go with a, a yes. Um, and the blink rate goes up massively at, at that point as well. So he's clearly under pressure. We see the swallow reflex as well. Second time around, he finds a way to obfuscate there. He finds a way around it. And in fact, just as Chase was saying, the, the, the lawyer offers him an out. And you see him smile because, you know, a beautiful moment has happened where he's been given the out for, for, for free. Um, so yeah, great lesson there in, in not, in what not to do. If you're trying to get info out of people, uh, don't, don't offer them the out there. So Scott, what do you got? This reminds me of, of, uh, interrogating or, you know, interviewing an embezzler because he's doing all the things that you see during that. When you ask him the question, he, he begins the question he freezes, doesn't blink. This is, this is as still as he gets from anything we've seen so far, super still. And then uh, he takes that little pause after he finishes with the, with the question to make sure to line up in his head. He's got that quite the answer ready to go. He knows what the answer is going to be, but he's thinking all that comes with it. Is this what I'm supposed to be saying? Yeah. When we talked about someone who's being deceptive before we talked about weight, your brain says it has to do three things. You know, makes you wait, has to think up a lie, then deliver the lie. So what he's doing is he's, his brain saying, hang on a minute, let's make sure that's okay. So that's, that's why we're seeing the pause there. And as he goes back, that's the classic moving back from being dishonest. He's not, people say, oh, you move back when you tell a lie or you're being deceptive. It happens quite often, doesn't happen every time, but that's what we're seeing here because he's ready because he's, he knows the answer. And then he scoots back as he starts uh, giving that answer. And we see his eyes flutter. You see those, those eyebrows, go, those eyelids go up and down really, really quickly because that's bothering him. Because when he says yes, not only is he saying, yes, I know he's he's accused, accused me of this, in other words, but he's thinking about all those things that went on leading up to leading up to that, whether they happened or not. I'm not saying they happened, but I'm saying if something were to happen, that's what you would see. He's he's thinking about those things that go through the, the event, not the details, just the event happening at that point. Then Greg and I do a, do a thing in this thing called the true crime workshop, where we have a whole module on realizing the threat. 
when the investigators are there and they start asking you questions, oh wait, I'm in trouble. They're they're asking me so so all the things that's what that's what we're seeing here. That's when he swallows when he realizes this is not good. You know, he knows it's not good anywhere. He wouldn't be there. But that's when we see that big swallow he takes right after that when he realizes the threat. And again, he freezes. And when that second question comes, that's when his mouth starts going nuts. I mean, he starts chewing on his mouth. We see every kind of, of mouth um, indicator you can or cue you can name. We see it in there. It's just like it's all of them right there. That's in, in that little three second spot there. He goes nuts with that. That lets me know, or that suggests to me, that he's saying to us with his body language, I'm, I'm really nervous, I'm really nervous, and this is really bothering me. Then the guy rephrases the question so he can say yes or no. So that's, yeah, so Chase, there you go. That was a real, this is a bad move on his part. Yeah, hey, so, one qualifier, I think I said all mammals move their mouth when they're thinking. Not all mammals, don't know, I've never sampled them all. The ones I deal with do. Humans <laughs> especially move their mouth when they're thinking, unless they're taught otherwise. Milk Somebody drinker. will find that and fact check me, I'm sure. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 you'll get that one. That's for dang sure. Okay. Were you aware that Jordan Chandler or his family on his behalf filed a litigation, a lawsuit against you? Yes. Okay. Were you aware at, that at some point in time in that lawsuit, Adrian McManus gave her deposition. I'm not positive. Your answer confuses me. Uh, how do you mean you're not positive? You don't know whether she gave her deposition or not. Exactly. We good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the ways I remember it starting is. Um, you know, Michael just sort of starting to touch my legs and touch my crotch over my pants. It progressed to him performing oral sex on me, him showing me how to perform oral sex on him. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so here's what I got. I got um, actually quite a lot of downward intonation uh, here. So. Uh, I talk about intonation quite a bit. You've got downward intonation, you've got straight intonation, you've got upward intonation, just as a generalized model. Downward intonation tends to be more secure, more certain. Upward intonation tends to be a question, and straight into intonation tends to be uh, just, you know, a, a fact, a statement. We're getting downward intonation here, so there's, there's certainty. We will get some upward intonation uh, coming here uh, later on, uh, but we get looks for uh, approval when the acts escalate. So there's no looks for approval on just the, the touching, but when the sexual acts come in, there's more looks for approval and some slight upward intonation on, I think, the word uh, him. Um, yeah, that's all I've got on, on that one. There we go. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So there's a distinct shoulder shrug when he says the word, one of the things I remember. We see his shoulder go up. And he says, one of the ways I remember it starting, this statement offers an escape that there could be more, there might be more somewhere else. He also uses, you know, and just starting to. So there's a lot of distancing language here. There's some internal conversation instead of recall with his eye movements here, which I think is a pretty strong data point. So if I'm the interviewer, that would be something I need to look into. And he prefaces the action with, you know, the words, you know. And I'm going to keep going through this and explain some stuff here towards the end. All statements have, or a lot of his statements have an upward tone, eyebrow flash for acceptance. He continues a lot of eye contact during the accusations. So the eye contact goes way up during any kind of accusation of misconduct. And the eye contact is normal and varied during other parts of his stories. And he continues to exhibit and I, I spent, I, I will admit, I've never done this much research on a video before. So I spent two hours today walking through his, his baseline, his, his other interviewers. And he continues to exhibit this exaggerated expression and behavior. It's a slower, more rehearsed speech during all the accusations. And if you watch the tape of this, 
you'll see a huge difference between when he's speaking about everything else and then his voice changes and he does something called a vocal fry during the stories about the events with Michael many times in this actual interview tape here. So why is that maybe not deceptive? Number one, it's a stressful event. Number two, I think a lot of this looking for approval and upward tonality is looking for approval. Can I say this on camera? Can we, can I talk about this in the open and up talk where people finish their sentences with invisible question marks is kind of a cool thing for people to do. So it's permissive speak has become very popular and he cuts his hair like an Instagrammer and has this, uh, face stuff going on right there. So he's very much into the the forward leaning part of the culture, which is embracing and hugging and celebrating up talk and uncertainty in speech. Declarative sentences are not cool anymore. Greg? Yeah, there's a handful of things here that make me wonder, of course. Now, let's also frame this. This is the guy who took the stand to defend Michael Jackson and said nothing ever happened. So under oath, took the stand, was the star witness. So he's got a reason to feel a little apprehensive as he's now saying something else. So a lot of these things, to your point, Chase, may or may not be deception. This is when you have to take into account what is going on in a person's head. And why we'll tell you, none of this makes us read minds. We would want to poke and ask questions after this. But he has a request for approval and a grief muscle, that little archy muscle right there that pops up when he starts talking about this. I, I also jumped on the one of the ways I remember this starting. That's a long distance. But also, this is a man admitting to having sex with Michael Jackson as a child. Regardless of whether you feel like you did anything wrong or not, there has to be all kinds of emotion and baggage and those things associated with it, considering where he's at in the middle of this documentary. So I'm not going to try to pretend to understand where he's at in his head, because none of us can. Every one of those kinds of things would be different. He does make a lot of eye contact and he asks a lot for approval. Now, there are lots of reasons you could do that. A victim of sexual assault, a victim of molestation, may be asking for approval to see if you think they're okay as they're telling you this story or were they part of the problem. So there are lots of reasons for this. I also see some grief as the corners of his mouth turned down when he's telling a story. And this is a relatively young man. He's also awkward in telling the story. So there's a lot of body language here that makes me look at him and go, what's going on in there? But I also have to take into account he could have committed perjury to protect Michael Jackson. He loved Michael Jackson in those days. And I don't mean that in terms of sexual anything. This is a kid who loved Michael Jackson. And then there's all kinds of feelings of guilt we know in people who are sexually molested and that kind of thing. So there's a tremendous amount going on in a person's head. And what I want you to know is you can't use body language to read a person's mind. We need to ask the next question. And that question doesn't get asked here. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, I, I've gone. Scott. So, okay. Scott. All right. Scott, what do you see? Uh, all right. Well, in this case, I'm seeing a lot of loping, which is just kind of like going along, telling the story. He seems comfortable with telling this from an uncomfortable space. So he's told this a lot of times. And and if I was in the situation and it was explained to you guys, I definitely wouldn't be using the same vernacular in terms and, and ways of presenting it that he is to her and TV as I would with you guys. So I'm sure he's used another uh, wording for this before. But as he's trying to make it, get it concise and compressed and get it in so his mother can hear it, so people can hear it and understand what happened without being too graphic, that's the part of the uncomfortable stuff I, th I think Chase is talking about seeing there. And part of it, when he, he shakes his head as he's explaining it, it's not that he's, most people will say, well, he's shaking his head no as he's explaining it. So he, that means no, that's not what's happening here. As he's going through this, he's, his, his brain is saying, man, that we shouldn't, so much comes with, the, with, with what he's saying, because like Greg was saying, he's protected this before. And he said, no, it didn't happen. He's so he's going against that. There's a there's a lot going on in there besides just delivering this story, in my opinion. So as he's delivering, he's saying he's shaking his head no. He's just say, his his brain's saying this is embarrassing. I shouldn't have done this part where I told him I shouldn't have I, or that that it wasn't true. All these things that I said somebody else was lying about that happened to me as well. 
he's dealing with that. So, so that's one of the reasons he's shaking his head. No. Um, I think he's embarrassed and frustrated at the same time. I think we're seeing a lot of those things come out when I've dealt with situations like this before and talking to somebody about it. I've seen behavior that looks just like this when, uh, and I've, I've told you, given you a couple of examples before, Greg, I've told you about a couple of those. And it's a situation where they're embarrassed and they're, they're telling it. And the story he's telling has been, he said all this before, but it's been boiled down to a statement, more than a statement, just a few statements to give that person to tell them what happened as it went along. So he's telling what happened as he goes through this without being really graphic. In other words, he's, he's being graphic, but he's, but he's not. He's getting right up next to graphic before he starts starts into that. So that's the uncomfortable thing I think we're seeing in all that. One of the ways I remember it starting is, um, you know, Michael just sort of starting to touch my legs and touch my crotch over my pants. It progressed to him performing oral sex on me, him showing me how to perform oral sex on him. All right, we're good? Yeah. Right. Did it scare you? Did you think it was wrong? The couple days prior to, to, to the abuse starting, he started touching me, just in the sense of, like, hand on my leg, lots of hugs, kissing my forehead, rubbing my hand. So there had been this kind of development of physical closeness that was happening already that felt like a father, it just felt amazing. As Michael started doing these sexual acts, he started talking to me about God brought us together. We love each other, and this is we how we love each other. We love each we. other, and this is how we show each other our love. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, here, here, again, his illustrators are very demonstrative. They're really big. When someone's not being honest, or, or let's say they're, they, they're giving signs of deception like we saw in the Michael Jackson ones, his illustrators were small. They're only big when he's batting away those those things we talked about earlier. These are big he's using, and he's very fluid. He's loping along, telling the story. He does have vocal fry here as well, but I think that's part of his personality in this case. So we're seeing these big demonstrative uh, illustrators, and his voice is staying at a pretty strong tone. There's not a lot of backing off of what he's saying, even though he's talking about something that's, that's really embarrassing. Another thing you'll, you'll, you'll notice in this is the the mirroring of the crossed legs in there between the, the two guys. They're both, and th the way they're sitting, there are two ways you can go in and cross your legs and you can be the masculine person. You sit down and you give it one of these. So here's what happened. And I'm being a guy, what are we gonna do You know about all this? Then you've got that Don Draper type where you come in and they do that and they give it one of these. And this is more of an alpha situation where you don't say, what are we gonna do? You're like, here's what's gonna happen next. And you're the one explaining what's what's happening. So in that case, they've taken on that persona of I'm here because it's about me, and I'm telling you what's happening. Is combined with those things we're talking about a minute ago, a, a second ago. That's what's given them the confidence to tell these things, or part of that confidence. They're here, or I'm here to tell you what happened, and that's what he's doing. I believe again, he's telling what happened in these cases, and um, yeah, I think I'll I'll stop there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I usually associate large illustrators with a true story. However, if they're way too demonstrative, I wonder. And, you know, that all this stuff makes me feel uncomfortable. Now, also, I will say, when a person feels guilt or remorse about something, they also can, you know, they'll rehearse and get everything together before they show out there. I don't know this guy's baseline. And shame on me, I should have gone and watched a video. If his hands are normally big talking, then this is real. But if all that is overly rehearsed, then shame on him, right? I can't, I haven't seen his baseline, so hard for me to say. We usually associated large movements, lots of illustrators with telling the truth. And he does have a very clearly enunciated story as he's going through this. It's not just his hands. If he's acting, and Mark, I'll, I'll pass it to you after this. If he's acting, he's doing a pretty damn good job because his gestures, his hand movements, his illustrators, his face, everything is punctuating at the same time. There's congruency is the term you would use in body language in the messaging. If his messaging is this good, he, I don't know what he does for a living these days, but he should be in advertising if his messaging is this good and he can rehearse and do it. It looks fluid, it looks natural, it looks believable. And other than that, certainly I see a little grief. I see you know a little bit of facial muscle movement that may indicate 
something else. But again, guys, there's a ton of money in this entire thing. I did read that they were not paid to do this show, but you know, Michael Jackson had a ton of money. There was a ton of money tied up in the lawsuit. The lawsuit they got settled out of court with uh, the kid they were talking about, Jordan Chandler. That was for a lot of money. This kid took the stand. Who knows what he got for that? Not saying he did or didn't. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of reasons for this guy to show nervous body language as he's delivering this message. And his message is congruent, face, hands, words, all at the same time. And that's hard to, to fake, in my opinion. So I'm going to pitch that to the expert on being able to fake it. Mark. Yes, but, yes. And and Mark, Mark, before yeah. you start, let, let me let me let me throw this up because I, I forgot to add this to my thing. Um, the first books I read of yours, you always talked about the truth pain plane and the passion plane. Yep. And I don't know if you're going to get into this here, but as we go through this, we explain what his hands are doing in the truth plane and the passion plane and the differences in those. Yeah. Yeah. So so. Uh, Greg, I got it. I got the same things written down here, which is clear illustrators and they're congruent with the story. They're very descriptive. So I think some of the kind of big demonstrative nature of it when he's coming up into passion, which is chest height here, uh, it's because he is energized about the story. We do get uh, descriptions of, of, of height, I believe, and, and, and stroking the head. And, and during all of these descriptions of the act, you get downward intonations. So there's a lot of congruency and certainty around the acts that happened. Uh, at the start, you see a lovely little gesture down in the in the truth plane here, yeah, which is an, around naval height, around a uh, couple of days beforehand, and he's and he's saying, yeah, I don't know whether it was this day or that day, and he has upward intonation on that. So there's uncertainty about the exact day that he's talking about, and then we get when he gets into the acts, clear clear downward intonation and demonstrative gesture, which fits in the rhythm of what he's saying. Then we get onto how he felt around it. So the feeling of, um, uh, of a father, and then we get upward intonation. So he's very clear on the acts that happened. He's not so clear about exactly what days before leading up to it they were. And then he's, he has uncertainty around the relationships and the feelings that went on. Because then we get the upward intonations around the idea of father, God. Th those are all things that are questionable. The, what it was said to him, the motives, the relationship is now questionable. I don't think it's questionable for him as to the acts that happened, the physical things that, that happened. Um, I think you're, you're right. It's pretty tough to to falsify such uh, such a, a kind of a coalition of information all at the same time. Yes, you could rehearse it. You could rehearse it. You could rehearse it. Doesn't feel rehearsed. Doesn't feel like. Uh, doesn't even feel like good acting. <laughs> it's just like somebody telling telling the story as they see it. There's too much variation, too much complexity for that to be a re rehearsed piece, in my in my opinion there. But Chase, what do, you, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's a lot going on here if you look at this. I went back and I watched him several years ago, all the way up to the videos where he was on Jimmy Kimmel. And he is very demonstrative with this gesture. So that is definitely his baseline. And what I thought was interesting here is his his body's completely fluid in speaking about the casual things that took place. When he gets to the abuse, his body closes up. The humerus bone, this bone right here, gets closer to his body. And our body is programmed from how, who knows how many millions of years of evolution to protect arteries when we get scared. So fear makes our shoulders come up. It makes our neck go like this. And these myotoclastoid muscles come out and they jump in front of the carotid artery. We have a brachial artery down here that squeezes in. The shoulders come up to protect the neck. So fear makes our body protect arteries. 
And we see some of that here towards the end when he's doing this. So he shows more confirmation glances at the end, more eyebrow flashing at the end. There's more upward tone at the end. And there's no more body narration except for small hand movements. So we go from big and they get smaller and smaller towards the end when he's talking about the actual abuse, as, as he calls it. And I think that this is not, even if I were going, ignoring the trauma, ignoring everything else, and just going off behavior, this still would not score above a 12 on the behavioral table of elements. This would be a 10.5. Did it scare you? Did you think it was wrong? A couple of days prior to, to, to the abuse starting, he started touching me just in the sense of like, hand on my leg, lots of hugs, kissing my forehead, rubbing my hand. So there had been this kind of development of physical closeness that was happening already that felt like a father, but just felt amazing. As Michael started doing these sexual acts, he started talking to me about God brought us together. We love each other and this is we how we love each other. We love each we other and this is how we show each other our love. He said I taught him how to French kiss. Um, and then it moves on to oral sex. But are it's are not, you frightened or thinking this is weird or wrong? No, no, it's in the context of a, a loving, close relationship. All right, Greg, what do you got? So here's a red flag for you, for me. This guy says, you taught me to do X. If you go watch this Bashir documentary, there's a part where Michael Jackson's on the train with a lot of children. And you're going to find him saying to a kid, when a kid says, you'll have to teach me to moonwalk, he goes, you all taught me to moonwalk. Yeah, teach us how to do the moonwalk. Oh, you know how to teach do the moonwalk. No, I learned it from you guys. Well, that's an interesting turn of phrase for this guy to know if that didn't happen. And that's a one-off in that video. Now, maybe he said that all the time to kids, but... Maybe he didn't. Maybe this is it. Other than that, you can see this kid, this guy has a lot of requests for approval as he's telling the story. But his illustrators, all of his messaging is toward Gail as he's talking to her. And everything is pushing toward her. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because for me, that phrase makes me want to go and talk to Michael Jackson. Of course, we can't. But and say, what happened? Because I would even use the wording and say, in an interrogation, what we refer to as guilty knowledge or something that other people wouldn't know about, those words, when you start to bring them up in the interview or in the interrogation, then you start to get demonstrative body language coming out of somebody because that's private conversation that occurred. And we have already seen that he doesn't mask all of his body language. So if in fact he did, and that was private language, we would have an end to his psyche and going after him. That's what I got. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, mine's gonna be pretty short too. Because uh, the personality difference in this is where we're seeing that dramatic difference in their illustrators and their approach and their tone and everything in this. Even his, when he's, his request for approval, what you're talking about, Greg. Um, but he's, he's, he's still loping along. Everything sounds good and clean. He's just not as loud. He's just not as, as um, demonstrative as, as the other guy. Um, and for his personality, though, I think those are large uh, illustrators. In that case, I'm not sure he's one that sits around doing those things like the other guy was doing, but he's using uh, larger illustrators at this at this point. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I would say his illustrators seem to match the story. They are they are big, but they seem to match. The rhythm is right. Uh, there's there's we we hear downward intonation on no no, so there's some certainty around that. You know, interesting. You bring up Greg this idea of uh, you taught me how to do that. That's a status raise. Um, uh, you know, that would be a, a classic within a, a grooming procedure. Uh, not saying that that's the case, just kind of rings a bell, uh, raises a flag for me around that. Uh, what's most interesting for me is the reaction of, of the first subject that we looked at as the second subject is being interviewed. And what we see from him is a, is a, uh, a big set of adapters and shift as we talk about it was all in the context of a loving relationship he shifts on that i think there's a very different idea about what the relationship signified one 
for for the second subject was in the context of a loving relationship no no felt felt fine for the first subject it was a father figure and therefore my guess is is the sexual acts don't ring as being wholesome and correct for that particular relationship that was being set up and that i think is why we get that adapter that big shift as he um especially around the ideas of um uh, were you frightened um, no, no, because it was a it was a, a loving relationship. I think our first subject was frightened. It, it wasn't comfortable uh, for him. So there's more stress, I think, around these ideas for the first subject rather than the second subject there. Uh, Chase, what have you got? Yeah, I think this is the most truthful video we've seen so far, or the least deceptive, we could say. The motion is fluid, the recall is genuine, and when she asked if he's frightened, we see something very telltale of truth-telling that she says, were you frightened? And then continues speaking, but he starts shaking his head before he says that he wasn't frightened. So I think we're seeing a lot of the valve is open, so to speak, that he's, he's willing to answer before the question is even finished being asked. So I think he's very open, very honest. And to your point, Mark, I absolutely agree that he views this in a different way. And maybe he he's viewing this in a way where he's modified that view over time for catharsis or for, to, to make it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And when you think about if you think then about, you know, why would have this person committed perjury potentially first time around? It's a father figure. I mean, to be honest, if my dad needs me to lie in court for him, I'm going to lie in court for him. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to happen. So, so you know, there, there's some complex relationships in, in here. Well, and he, he further says, the first guy further says that, you know, it's his word against nobody's, but Michael Jackson told him that if they were discovered, they would both, their lives would be over and they'd both be in real trouble. So... There you go. Go to jail, I think he even said it. Yeah, time. forever. Yeah, yeah. Their life would be over. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. strong okay. relationships of love and threat at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Complex. So, yep. All right. He said I taught him how to French kiss. Um, and then it moves on to oral sex. But it's Are not, you frightened or thinking this is weird or wrong? No, no, it's in the context of a, a loving, close relationship. Here we go. And there's no alarm bells going off in your head or, or any thoughts like that. Really, it's just, I love this person and, and uh, th we're trying to make each other happy. He said, oh, I was his first, but even as a kid, you don't even know what that means. So your lovers and your best friends. All right, Chase, what do you got? We're seeing a continuation with the eyebrow flash for confirmation. I think there's a potential, the camera angle is strange, but I think there's a potential grief muscle there when he's saying, I love this person. If there's not, there's asymmetrical head movement on the forehead and asymmetrical head movement happens. If you can see this brain back here, natural facial expressions come from right around here. Fake ones come from up here in the top. This one up here, has been doing it for a couple hundred thousand years. This one down here at the bottom has been doing it for a hundred million. This one up here, our, our fake facial expressions, or when they're not real, tend to be asymmetrical because that part of the brain is not extremely exercised in tightening the muscles on both sides of the face equally. So we do see some of that when we're, when we're seeing the, the one phrase, I love this person. So there's a little... One thing in the video, I think the final part when he said lovers and best friends was cut and spliced in and it was not part of this answer. So I'm completely ignoring it. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, uh, same thing. I call this the organ of communication or connection, right? Your forehead. I constantly, we constantly use our forehead. We use our forehead to signal recognition. We use our forehead to signal grief unintentionally. We ask for approval. We use our forehead in all kinds of ways. I browbeat you. And you can see he's trying to make connection with the interviewer, with Gail, and he's, his brow is constantly moving as he's asking the question and talking. But I don't see it as request for approval like, I'm lying and I want you to believe me. I think it's more of the, 
vulnerable, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Are you judging me? Kind of a look. When the, the brow is constantly moving and the, his messaging is almost like he's asking for approval. His body's getting smaller. I don't see him as lying. I don't see a lot of signs of deception because I look for messaging to all tie together. Again, his, his story is moving along, what he's saying. While it might seem awkward to us for him to say we were in a loving relationship kind of a thing, it, for him at that time, whatever he was told is what his brain is saying, or whatever he recalls being told is what his brain is saying. If he's lying, he's got his rhythm down, all of his body language and his gestures there, and he's asking for approval like a child who would have been in the wrong kind of relationship by no fault of his own might do. Because, guys, this is how we have to be careful. People ask us this all the time. When you're asking and interrogating people, if you're interviewing somebody who has been the victim of some, of a crime, it's really easy to confuse their lack of thorough facts with deception because the way our brain works is under duress, like the first guy may have been, we don't lay down the same kind of memories we do when we are relaxed. And you know, a child, somebody who has gone through this, they're gonna have memories of things and sketchy pieces. And it's very difficult to figure out exactly what's true and what isn't. And so you have to try to remove your own biases in either way, whether it's you believe Michael Jackson did something or you don't. What we're looking at is fluid movement that looks like He's signaling what he's saying. That's mine. Um, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Chase, completely concur there. Um, I, I love this person, upward inflection on that. So it's more questioning, was that, was that relationship true? I was his first upward inflection. Again, questioning, there's uncertainty that, that whether that was true. Odd thing to say to a to a child to raise status there around a sexual act. Odd. Um, uncertainty is cool now though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uncertain yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uncertainty is 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 cool. It doesn't for me have that um that rhythm of the up talk of the 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 coast of America or that west coast. West coast up talk. Uh valley <laughs> valley talk. Um, so, so, and, and we do, you know, we do get that certainty on no, no beforehand. So it's not like he's doing up talk on everything, which is what I would get with somebody who's doing it for social reasons to fit in, to say, I'm one of the group, you know, listen to my up talk there. Um, yeah. So a good call as well, Chase on there's a, there's a jump cut in there, which means we, we don't quite know what happens. The, the reason we know that there's a big jump cut in there is the first subject, we see them go from their hand isn't there to their hands up here. But the one thing that that does give us is we get to see a self-soothing gesture there, which again makes me feel like whatever is being talked about here or before that moment, and again, we don't know because it jump cuts, is he needs to, to soothe himself around this. I think, again, the, 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 the relationship to these acts are very different from each, uh, each subject there. Very different experience, very different idea of the relationship and what would have been right uh, in that relationship. Uh, so, Scott, take us home. What do you got? Right. Well, I've also, I've, I've seen a couple other uh, interviews with people who have, who have been who are, have accused him of this as well. And one of the guys said, uh, he also said he was he was the only one, or he was his first, this first one he's, he's been like this with. So that seems to be a, a common theme through, throughout that. And with this guy we're talking, we're, we're looking at now, again, he's, he's, he's fairly comfortable, he's loping. And I mean, comfortable as in delivering the story in the state that he's in, because it's probably the state he gets in every time he, he's doing that. Everything looks the way it should to me. The only thing that bothers me is he, he places the situation in third person. He separates himself from it, which is quite common in these things because he says, you don't understand this and you're not, you're not aware of this and you don't do this as he's telling that story. And that's when he, that's, I think this is the only time he does that. So that's kind of, that kind of bothers me, but I know the differences in that. But if you're looking for that, because I think we've talked about it before, that's what's happening here. He's uncomfortable with it. It's something that's a traumatic, uh, Thing that's happened to him so he is separating himself from him. that's one way to do it so you'll quite often hear him hear the the victim talk that way 
I didn't see any deception in, in this one at all either. So that's short and to the point from my part. And there's no alarm bells going off in your head or, or any thoughts like that. Really, it's just, I love this person and, and uh, th we're trying to make each other happy. He said, oh, I was his first, but even as a kid, you don't even know what that means. So your lovers and your best friends. So as we go, so if you like what we're doing, be sure to subscribe and uh, click that little bell and let you know uh, when we have a video coming out. And Chase, you had something you were going to talk about? Yeah, we talked a lot about baselining in this video, a whole lot about deviations from baseline, what a person's baseline is. There's some great scientific research on this from accredited universities and, and well-respected journals. I put some stuff together. I even made a website for you guys to go to. It is scottrouseishandsome.com. You guys can go to this website right now. All of the baseline research is there right now. Knock it out, Tan Daddy. There you go. <laughs> Is that real? That's a real website. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> no. I'm going there now. Okay, I thought you were messing with me. Now. Okay. Oh, oh man. The behavior panel. Tandaddy.com is available. But oh, sh**. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, Lord. Get the research on the baseline. Oh, no, dude, don't. Is this going to be a bunch of pictures? That's good. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enhancedness. That's uh, good. good Lord. Very Case nice. Very here. nice job, Chase. That's uh, that is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's good. Okay, you got me. You stung me. Sí, no, 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 no,